Okay, members, we now move on to questions to the Minister of Justice, and I call Sean Lynch to ask the first question. Mr. Lynch. Chair Silverhain, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The care of vulnerable people is of paramount importance and is taken very seriously across the justice system. This is particularly important in the context of the work of the Northern Ireland Prison Service, as we seek to care for and support a significant number of people with complex and challenging health needs who find themselves in custody. In answering a similar question, in February of this year, I indicated the RQIA had been asked to undertake the review and would report by September 2020. Unfortunately, as a result of the pressures caused by the developing pandemic, it was not possible for this review to be completed. My department and the Department of Health continue to work with the RQIA to complete the review, with delivery of the final report now expected in May 2021. Although I regret that the announced review of vulnerable people in custody has not taken place, by working closely with the South Eastern Trust, our health care provider, the prison service has made significant progress in improving the support to people who are at risk. Sean Lynn, supplementary. And I want to thank the Minister for her answer. And I know the Minister said at the beginning of the year uh, she indicated that her intention was to discuss the issue of uh, vulnerable people within the prisons. Uh, can the Minister now commit to taking this important work forward as a priority with her counterpart, the Minister of uh, Health, Gurmaigan? I can indeed commit to it being a priority. It would have happened by September, but for the fact that COVID meant the RQIA, as you will understand, were repurposed and refocused um, in order to assist with the health crisis. But we are now working with the RQIA to ensure that that review takes place. We have, however, delivered a lot in the interim. So we have a joint suicide and health uh, self-harm risk management strategy, a joint management of substance abuse uh, misuse and custody strategy. We are reviewing our supporting prisoners at risk procedures, and that has reviewed in the delivery of a new person-centred approach, which aims to support someone through periods of crisis or distress, as well as addressing the root causes. We now have wellbeing hubs in each of the prisons, which provide therapeutic environments for people in care um, who need the trust um, mental health teams, and also specific therapeutic spaces in each of the establishments to provide multidisciplinary support to people at risk. So it is a priority. We are still making progress, but I still want to see the review done by the RQIA as quickly as possible. Nicole Doug Beatty. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, Minister, uh, a death in custody is unusual. Uh, two deaths. Uh, in 10 days uh, is extremely rare, and our thoughts are with the family uh, of those who have, who have died. However, does the Minister think it's acceptable uh, that this Assembly and the Justice Committee found out about the second death via social media and whistleblowers, especially in light of the fact that I raised the issue about chronic understaffing of night custody officers? Mr Speaker, I want to unpick some of the issues in the question. Firstly, with respect to deaths in custody, every death in custody is not just unusual, it is a tragedy. There is a family who are grieving as a result of that death in custody, and it is our practice in Northern Ireland Prison Service to carefully liaise with families about public announcements. In the case of the second death, it was at the request of the family that no public announcement was made, and that was respected. However, in both cases, the deaths, as you would expect, were reported immediately to the prisoner ombudsman um, and also to the coroner um, and the PSNI. And a full investigation will happen into each of those deaths in custody. And it is absolutely crucial that people do not make preemptive or prejudging statements um, in relation to deaths in custody when the nature of that death has not even yet been investigated or established. With respect to the specific issue and unrelated issue of staffing in the prison, I can assure the member um, that the prisoner, uh, the governor and the senior management team scrutinise staffing figures daily, including night staff deployment and redeploy staff where necessary. That process ensures adequate numbers are on duty at all times. And I can confirm that there were adequate numbers, the full complement in all residential areas of the prisons on both nights when those tragic incidents took place. Okay, thank you. And uh, I call uh, Linda Dillon. Question two. Mr Speaker, with your permission, um, I will answer questions two and ten together. Firstly, I want to say again how much I regret that this incident happened and apologise to the victims of these offences for any additional trauma they have suffered as a consequence. 
I realise how difficult it must be to accept the convictions of those who committed these crimes against them will be rescinded, and how difficult it is to hear these issues discussed in the public domain. My priority throughout has been to ensure that the victims are protected as much as is possible from further distress, and once I was made aware of how the PPS intended to proceed, I sought assurance from the Director that support would be in place when victims were informed about the intention to set aside the convictions and continuing for as long as is necessary once victims had time to absorb and consider the information. The Director provided that assurance and advised he had engaged the services of victim support at Nexus, and I am grateful to both for their assistance during this period. My officials have had regular meetings with colleagues in the PPS um, in 2020 to understand what went wrong. Further meetings are taking place in the coming months to take stock and consider what actions are necessary to ensure that the lessons learned from the current situation are applied going forward. As part of this approach, I've tasked a senior lawyer in the department to develop a quality assurance check mechanism, which will be built into processes involved in both developing policy and drafting uh, provisions for future legislation. I have also spoken with the Director of Public Prosecutions and we have agreed that a joint system review will be, re will be formed between both the DPS um, and DOJ to take forward work in that regard. Linda Dillon, supplementary. and thank the Minister for her answer to the question and thank you for coming to the House last week. Obviously, out of that arose some further questions, but just in relation to, have you an update? And you did give us a, quite a, a good update last week, but I would like to know if, we, if you have an update on how many of these there will be re-prosecutions or on how many there won't, if you have those figures, particularly around the issue around those who are on the sex offenders register. With respect um, to the re-prosecution, obviously you will appreciate that that is not a matter um, for my department. It is a matter for PPS and it is too early, I think, at this stage to judge um, whether there will be re-prosecutions in all or some of those cases. They are currently liaising with the victims um, to take on board their views. They will also look at the evidence um, and also what impact it has on the protection of public safety. That is one of the core issues that they will have to consider as they reach their decisions. However, as I explained last week, there are certain protections in place with respect to public safety. So the fact that these convictions have been overturned does not mean um, that they will not turn up, for example, on access and eye checks. It will simply be put through the filter, first of all, um, of the senior police officer responsible for responding to those checks. Call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, uh, can I confirm if your officials have actually met with any of the victims? And has the minister uh, met them herself, or has she any plans to do so in the future? Mr Speaker, my officials have not met with the victims. Um, they have been contacted by the Director of Public Prosecutions and his team, as would be appropriate, as it was their decisions to prosecute the cases. Um, if any victim wishes to speak to me, of course, as with all other victims, I would be willing to meet with them. However, I would certainly not be wishing to impose any further trauma or debate around these issues on them, if perhaps some of them simply now have acknowledged that the error has happened and don't wish to discuss it further. We have to proceed sensitively with these issues, but certainly if a victim wishes to meet with me or with my officials, I would be more than happy to do so. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister what measures that she has put in place to ensure that there is no perverse compensations are made available to those that are convicted under the legislative area? With respect um, to compensation, um, I think we have already noted last week that it would be my intention that if anyone were to seek compensation for their conviction, that we would, re we would resist that robustly as a department. These are not these are not flawed convictions. These are robust convictions, many of them, I think at least half of them actually as a result um, of guilty pleas. So there isn't a question here about the validity of the conviction, simply about the court in which it was taken forward. So we would not, um, we would not be willing to consider lightly any claim for compensation and we will resist that. With respect to other payments that those, may have, those individuals may have made, they may be entitled um, to reclaim those, and we have said that we will indemnify the victims um, of those crimes from having to repay any compensation. They're relatively small amounts of money, but nevertheless, I think the indignity um, would be significant were we to expect any victim um, to repay, given that none of this is their fault. So we will indemnify any victim um, where there is an attempt to reclaim that money. Um, however, there's no clarity that that would be the case in any of these cases at this stage. I call Paul Fruit. 
thank the Minister for her very clear statement last week on this issue. And in that statement, the Minister stated that it was some three months between her department knowing and the Minister knowing about this issue. Can the Minister clear up for this House whether the Minister received any sort of inkling or briefing before she was informed? Or was that vacuum of three months in, with, in which that the Minister was kept completely in the dark? Well, I set out the timeline very clearly last week, Mr Speaker, um, when I was informed, when the department was informed and what they were informed of, and I have nothing to add to that statement today. I think it is important for members to understand that there may, on occasion, be issues that arise within the department where someone thinks there may be a problem or concerned that there is a problem, and it is important that we allow people to do that investigatory work in order that when they come to the minister, they come with the full picture, and I think that is what officials were seeking to do. I have to say that what I want to have within the department and within the justice system more widely is a system where people feel free to come forward and raise issues if they have concerns, raise issues with the minister if they're concerned about um, that there may have been errors or faults, because what we want in all of this is to have a justice system that is responsive and is properly held to account. And creating that culture of accountability is hugely important, but it involves allowing staff also to do their jobs without constantly feeling that someone is breathing down their neck. Call Sinead Bradley. Mr Speaker, uh, would the Minister accept that there is now a duty on her to take action to preserve any documentation or evidence that was used during the original convictions um, should re-prosecutions have to occur? Well, Mr Speaker, one of the key documents that will be preserved is the court record um, from the original trials where people will have pleaded guilty um, or indeed where evidence will have been presented. Um, there may not be a huge amount of other evidence actually available. Some of these cases date back to 1973. So we have to be realistic in terms of what will and will not be available. Um, however, there's been no suggestion um, from the DPP that lack of evidence would be an issue in deciding whether or not to re-prosecute these cases. I call Stuart Dixon. Question number 13. Or supplementary. Supplementary. Oh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, Minister, you've had a meeting with the PPS with regards to uh, this situation. What assurances have you received that this error or errors like this will not reoccur? Well, I think that there are two things we need to do from this. The first is to put the victims in this particular situation first and ensure that every um, resource is available to them that they need in order to cope with what has happened. And the second is to look robustly at the system. This was a unique error. Um, and not one that we have seen happen anywhere else in the system. However, that is not to say that it is not possible that there would be other errors because this is a human error and those things do happen. The important issue is how we respond to it and part of that response is that we will work with the DPP to review all of those changes in legislation and to make sure um, that we're saving provisions where necessary, that those are indeed in place um, and learn going forward um, so those are not repeated. I also think, um, Mr Speaker, with fairness to this chamber, um, that its presence here and the scrutinising role which it performs is possibly the best safeguard against what happened um, in that particular case in 2008, when at that time we were not here um, able to do that work as an assembly in terms of justice. And I think that the scrutiny role which committees play in terms of looking carefully, clause by clause, of pieces of legislation, asking questions and scrutinising how things are taken forward is absolutely critical in terms of avoiding a repeat. On a call, Gary Middleton. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I want to answer questions 3 and 14 together. Ensuring the safe, the safe operation of custodial environments is a top priority for my department. The Northern Ireland Prison Service has followed the advice of the Public Health Agency and worked closely with the South Eastern Trust to implement an extensive range of precautionary measures in March of this year. These measures included the suspension of in-person visits, forms of temporary release, significantly restricting access to prison establishments and the introduction of house-based routines to support social distancing. Further to those specific measures, there are robust arrangements in place for the isolation of individuals committed to custody or who become symptomatic. Northern Ireland Prison Service also has well-developed and embedded procedures for prisoners and staff to be tested for COVID-19. Prisons also have extensive arrangements for the supply and appropriate use of PPE and for hand washing. 
All of this work has been supported by regular communication about the risks of infection and how these can be mitigated. Advice about hand washing, catch it, kill it, bin it, and social distancing is widely displayed and reinforced at establishment level and service wide. On the 3rd of July, Prison Service formally initiated its Operation Recovery Plan. Through this recovery plan, the measures introduced will be incrementally and gradually relaxed, provided that the risk posed by the virus does not alter and impact on those plans. Well, Gary Middleton. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, Minister, what preparations are you taking in terms of sickness, absence within the prison service staff and potential longer-term longer complications arising from those recovering from COVID-19? Question and clearly absence was a consideration um, at the height of the pandemic in the spring and it may well become a consideration again. There were a number of measures that we were able to take at that time, um, including additional payments, additional um, hours worked, but we have to be realistic um, about how we manage our resource and so we will be responsive um, to any changes in attendance um, at work. There are a number of our prison officers who also fall into the vulnerable category and we need to recognise that as well, um, in addition to the fact that we have a significant cohort of people within the prison system who are also vulnerable. So there is, an, a, there is a lot of work being done to ensure that we have the proper staff complement. There have been recent recruitments um, into prison service and we are continuing to work forward with that um, as new people um, are brought onto the service and we hope that that will help alleviate some of those concerns. I call Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I um, thank the Minister for her responses thus far? In her response, she referred to some of the restrictions in terms because of COVID in terms of visits and such like. Um, in terms of the visit, in terms of the protesters outside, do you believe that the prison service has done enough to actually bring that to an end, uh, uh, as opposed to actually putting an additional burden, sorry, burden within the service? Well, first and foremost, the policing of protests outside the prison are not a matter for a prison service. They are a matter for the Police Service of Northern Ireland. Um, prison service um, worked at all times uh, with the police in terms of the protest. If the member is referring to the protest within the prison, um, I believe that prison service acted in a proportionate way, as it has done throughout the COVID crisis, in terms of ensuring that those who return to the, uh, to the prison um, from outside, whether that be um, from a hospital, and in this case it was Craigavon Area Hospital where there had been a spike in COVID, um, or whether it is from the general public, go through a period of isolation in order to ensure that we keep the prison population safe and free of COVID-19. Given what has happened in other residential environments and indeed in other prisons across these islands, um, I think it is to the credit of our prison service that we have managed to only have one case detected of COVID in the prison, and that was in the isolation unit, which was doing the job to which it was actually uh, designed. Next question, I call Jerry Kelly. Well, the short title of the Act is the Serious Crime Act 2007. Its provisions are not limited to dealing with serious crime offences, though that was the purpose. This is the case particularly in Part 2 of the Act, which introduced offences of encouraging and assisting crime. Section 44 falls under Part 2 of the Act. Section 44 of the Serious Crime Act 2007 created the offence of intentionally encouraging or assisting an offence. It sets out what a person must do to commit the offence and provides further definition as to what is meant by intention. Its application across the spectrum of criminal offences, um, and that is not only intended for serious crime. Paul well, Jerry Kelly, supplementary. Thank the Minister for the answer up to now. And uh, as you may have anticipated, my, my next question is, is about, um, as you suggested, the purpose, uh, the purpose of it was suggested for, as the name says, serious and organised crime. And uh, while I know she can't talk about any particular case, just let me say in terms of background, that the PSNI used it on the 6th of June, uh, on both in Derry and in Belfast, I think on five occasions um, to that. And, I think I may have said this, but if I didn't, obviously I have to say I'm a member of the police board as well. Uh, in the Black Lives Matter, which has caused a, a lot of consternation. So I suppose the, the question to the minister on the basis of what the answer she has given is does she believe that it is either proportionate or appropriate to use this, I'm not speaking about, I use that as background, but to use uh, serious crime legislation for peaceful protests uh, or anything like that? Well, Mr. Speaker, 
Speaker, the issue um, of protest is not necessarily only whether it is peaceful, it is also whether it is lawful, and that was the, the, the point in question. Um, but it would not be appropriate, given the investigations that are ongoing by the Ombudsman, um, by the policing board itself, um, and also um, given that these cases are still potentially before the courts, for me to comment on the specific use um, of the offence. I'm also aware of the comments made in the press today by the Director of Public Prosecutions in relation to the use of this offence. I think it would be best for all of us now to wait on the outcome of the investigations that have been set out in order to judge that. I can only speak to the legislation, and whilst the legislation does is the Serious Crime Act, um, the, se the sections of that act which were used are not solely for the use in serious crime. They can be applied across a range of other offences. I call Paul Given. Um, we know that the Minister has been tasked with looking at enhancing the enforcement powers around COVID. Uh, is she going to be making reference to this uh, section as part of considering those issues? Well, to correct um, the record, Mr. Speaker, I volunteered to look at the issue of serious offences um, because, like all my executive colleagues, I want to play an active role in ensuring that we are able to deal with this issue in a timely way. Um, we will not necessarily be, re be referring to this particular offence, but there is an issue which it points to, and that is about differentiating, Mr. Speaker, between those who, in good faith, embark on activities, believing them to be organised by someone else in a way that complies with the regulations, and those who organise activities and fail to comply with the regulations. I think the burden ought to lie more with those who organise events inappropriately um, and without due regard than those who perhaps attend in the, in the false confidence um, that they're attending an event which is safe and secure. And so we do want to look at the penalties, not just in relation to individual infractions, but also to those who are organising um, events, who are managing facilities and who are not taking due regard um, to the regulations. Next question, I call Mike Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, question five. It is important to understand that the management of separation in our prisons is complex, challenging and at times dangerous. Therefore, I want to begin by paying tribute to the staff of Northern Ireland Prison Service for the commitment and the courage they demonstrate every day working on our behalf. If a prisoner, whether sentenced or on remand, applies for and subsequently meets the criteria set by the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland for separation, then the prison service is required to hold that individual in accommodation apart from the other prisoners at that establishment. We currently have 42 adult male prisoners in Magabri, 19 loyalists and 23 dissident republicans accommodated on four landings in Bush and Row houses, and three dissident republican female prisoners held on one landing in Fern House at Hyde Bank Wood. It costs the prison service in excess of £2 million per annum to operate separation at Magabri, and we expect annual running costs at Hyde Bank to be in the region of £330,000. Irrespective of whether we agree with the concept of separation or not, it is vital that these landings are appropriately staffed and security is commensurate with the level of risk of the prison service is required to manage. I, call Meg Nesbitt, supplementary. I thank the Minister for, for that. A fortnight ago, she, she told me in this chamber that she would uh, support an end to segregation. Uh, but that the matter lies with the Northern Ireland Office. And, and I quote her here, it is not my duty to direct the Secretary of State. Does she understand nobody was asking her to direct the Secretary of State, just questioning why, if she's in favour of an end to segregation, she hasn't had the conversation with the Secretary of State? Well, Mr Speaker, first and foremost, um, with all due respect to the member, he's not aware of what conversations I have or have not had with anyone. Um, he did not ask that question and I did not answer it. With respect to the separated regime, it exists because conditions in wider society create a need for the regime. Bringing about an end of the separated regime depends on our collective success at tackling paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime. The Executive has an action plan, which it is implementing, and has committed to extending that programme of work we are using to build resilience in individuals and in communities. It is vital that we also provide the political leadership to enable that change to happen. Prison Service has a range of commitments under that action plan, and these are important in their own right, but they cannot address the wider and underlying conditions that will depend on the success of the overall action plan. The focus and priority in our prisons has been on keeping people safe 
throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. That is what we have done, and I pay tribute to the staff for their work in that. There is a commitment to review the operation of separation under the Tackling Paramilitarism programme. That will be taken forward when possible, but the focus for now is on managing the risks to persons from COVID-19. Thank you, Minister, for your answer. Minister, I'm sure you would agree with me and indeed every right-thinking person that the sooner we end segregation and bring about the circumstances to end segregation, the better. That can only be done through tackling paramilitarism and other criminal activities like that in our communities. But there are also other issues which we need to deal with in order to deal with segregation in our community. We have segregation in education, in housing, teacher training and other things. Some of those might be easier asks, but, Minister, today it is important that we all work together to end segregation in our prisons. Mr Speaker, our prisons are a microcosm of the society in which we live. If we want to tackle separation within the prison system, we need to tackle segregation outside the prison system. All of us have a role to play in that, not just me as the Minister, but if leadership is required in these areas, I will not be found wanting, which is why I have set up um, the political advisory group around the Tackling Paramilitarism programme. We have had our first meeting. We intend to meet again, and we will be driving this forward, hopefully, with collective political engagement. But it has to be a collective response, and I have to put first the safety and security of those in the prison, not just those in the separated regime, but the rest of the prisoners within the prison. Nicole Gemma Dolan. Could the Minister outline what plans she has for wider and more comprehensive reform of the overall prison system? Well, the member will be aware that Prisons 2020 is just about reaching its expiry date, and whilst a huge amount of good work has been achieved under that, we are now in the process of looking at the next phase of improvement. Um, we obviously are on a constantly improving situation in terms of trying to ensure that support for prisoners is improving, that accommodation is improving, um, and that we are making the kind of investment in our prison system, particularly um, around rehabilitation issues, um, that will allow people, when they exit the prison, to rejoin society and play a constructive and productive role. I believe that that should be the focus of what we look at when we look at our prisons, because being successful in rehabilitating prisoners is the best way we can prevent further victims of crime. I call Jim Allister. Um, thank you. I'm sure, Minister, uh, none of us need reminded how tight finances are, particularly during COVID. But am I to understand from a written answer which you gave me that in respect of landing four in Fern House, £482,000 was spent to prepare that landing for three women Republican prisoners, and that the annual ongoing cost, the resource cost, will be £355,000. Have we really got things into the proportion that they should be in in these times? Well, I, like the member, am very concerned about the cost of separation um, within the prison system. The previous separated unit at Hyde Bank is now a mother and baby unit, and the interim accommodation that was being used was not considered suitable from a security perspective. Consequently, Landing 4 in Fern House was identified as a discreet and more secure facility. Extensive work was required at a cost of approximately £482,000 to repurpose the unit, and the work had to be completed within a two-week period. Structural, electrical, mechanical work was all required to enhance security, and it is right that we ensure that an adequate and appropriate level of security is in place to manage the challenges presented by separation and by particular prisoners. Unlike McGabry, Hyde Bank is not a Category A prison, but the risks presented by those who do not recognise the legitimacy of their imprisonment is no less significant at Hyde Bank than it is at McGabry, and it is right that we should invest in that. I would want to reassure members, however, that despite all of that expenditure, less than £6,000 was spent on cell furniture, soft furnishings and recreation room. I believe that it is right the prison service provide modern, decent and fit-for-purpose accommodation. I visited the unit myself to ensure that that is what we have done. This is not in any shape or form about luxury or preferential treatment. It is about decency, it is about security, and it is about managing a very difficult environment professionally, competently and humanely. That ends the period for a list of questions, and I will move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. They call Alan Chambers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Uh, Minister, I understand that the Northern Ireland Policing Board are currently dealing with a complaint under their standing orders against one of its board members, Mr Jerry Kelly, MLA. Uh, by consideration for informal resolution by their vice chair, and if that cannot be achieved, being referred on to the chair. However, the minister does have the powers under the Police Northern Ireland Act 2000 to take action to remove a member of the policing board. Can't she confirm if there is anything in the Police Act that compels her to await the outcome of any internal action by the policing board? before she can consider or exercise these powers of removal? Mr Speaker, um, on this issue, um, I have to put my position on record. I find um, Mr Kelly's uh, comments offensive and inappropriate. And I ask that he reaffirm his commitment to non-violence and exclusively peaceful and democratic means, consistent with his responsibilities, both as a member of the Northern Ireland Policing Board and as a member of this House. Any investigation into whether Mr Kelly is in breach of Policing Board Code of Conduct is a matter for the Board in the first instance. I am aware of the powers available to me under the Policing Northern Ireland Act 2000 to remove members of the Policing Board, and should this matter come before me, I will give it careful consideration. But as Minister for Justice, I have to stand for due process, and it would be wrong for me to make decisions precipitately before the due process has been followed. Mr Chambers. Minister, uh, with respect, is it not the case uh, that, in fact, you have moved outside due process by calling on Mr Kelly to reaffirm his commitment to uh, uh, peaceful means uh, and uh, the, the, the code of conduct of the policing board does appear to be silent on, on what action they can take, but public confidence in the board has been seriously undermined and, and would the minister not give consideration to dealing with this as a matter of urgency? Well, no, I don't believe, Mr Speaker, that I have gone outside due process. Every single one of us in this House has a duty to call on all members to respect the rule of law, to be temperate in their exchanges, to be sensitive to victims. And so I don't believe that it, it in any way um, precludes whatever decisions will be brought forward by the Board. I await the outcome of the Board's deliberations on this matter, and when they're brought to me, they'll get the due consideration and regard that they deserve. Michelle McElveen. I ask the Minister for her assessment of the appropriateness and effectiveness of penalties where breaches of COVID regulations um, have taken place. Mr Speaker, the issue of penalties um, is one that is currently under review. It is hard to judge, quite frankly, whether or not the distribution of penalties is what drives people's behaviour or whether instead it is people's genuine concern um, for their family, their friends and their community. I rather believe that it is the latter. At the beginning of this COVID crisis, we saw people act in extraordinary ways, making huge sacrifices in order to protect their family, their community and their loved ones. I believe that by the four E's, so by engaging, explaining and encouraging, we are helping and assisting people in being able to continue to comply with the regulations. However, as with any law, there must be some enforcement and it must be fit for purpose. And so my review that I'm undertaking with other executive colleagues this week will look very carefully at that issue and take recommendations to executive in due course. Michelle McElveen, supplementary. Thank you, and, and I appreciate the response from the Minister. Given the extent and the scale of some of the breaches to date and um, the lead role that the junior ministers are playing on the ministerial led group on compliance and enforcement. Can I ask the Minister to outline the extent of her personal commitment and that of her officials to the work of that group? My senior officials sit on the group um, and contribute to the discussions. I raise these issues on my, uh, my bi-weekly calls with the Chief Constable in order to ensure that there is good um, policing input into this. Um, though I have to constantly remind members, it is not only the police who are responsible for enforcement. Councils also have a role in that. And when it came to the review um, of the penalties, I offered to take that forward as a separate piece of work, and I will be bringing um, the recommendations um, to the executive um, in due course, hopefully in advance of this Thursday's executive meeting. I think it's important that all members of the 
executive are committed to this. I should also note um, that having engaged with police, with councils and with others, um, they are now looking at a different model in terms of how they take forward these issues under civil contingencies legislation, which would actually probably transfer responsibility for leadership on this to health as they wish to be tasked from a health perspective with the duties that they undertake as they don't sit comfortably um, within the justice sphere. I call Cathal Boyle. And Coyle, just following on from the previous speaker in relation to fines and the imposition of fines in relation to the regulations for wearing masks or face coverings, can the Minister just give her assessment of that and whether or not there has been sufficient enforcement in terms of these regulations? Well, I think there is a danger in thinking that because there have been no fines on an issue, there has been no activity around that issue. I think that that is, is flawed um, in terms of the narrative. If we actually engage with the police and talk to them, they make many thousands of interventions with people on an average week where they speak to people, they ask them to wear a mask, they explain the importance of it and they explain the regulations. And the vast majority of people who are able to do so comply. So the fact that we are not handing out fines for this is not either that unusual because there have not been a significant number of fines um, across GB for this either. It is quite a difficult area for the police to enforce. There are sensitivities in terms of people, people's underlying health conditions that may make it difficult for them to wear masks. There can be complications in terms of determining the age of an individual and as to whether or not they should or shouldn't be wearing a mask in different circumstances. But I think it's incumbent on all of us to show leadership because by showing leadership, by showing that we recognise the importance of wearing a face covering when we are in closed circumstances where we may find social distancing being breached, by showing people that we don't see it as in some way emasculating or a pointless exercise, I think we can show leadership in the community and hopefully encourage others to take their responsibilities in that regard equally as seriously. Cal Boyle, supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for that response? Just, Minister, there has been disturbing reports about uh, unacceptable abuse towards workers, in particular shop workers who have played a vital role over this pandemic. Can I ask the Minister to give assurances that such unacceptable abuse will be tolerated by her department and by the criminal justice system? Well, I mean, I think we have perhaps all at times been witnessed uh, to people who have been less than gracious when they've been asked to put on a mask in a shop or a restaurant or wherever they may be. To the people who have gone out every day throughout this pandemic and have served the community in order to keep things ticking over. Anyone who gets abusive towards staff risks exactly the same penalty as they would at any other time. Engagement has to be civil. If people have good reason not to wear a mask, there is nothing to preclude them making that clear without getting into altercations with shop workers. And those who do, and we've been clear about this, while the police may not have the resources to be in every shop or on every bus or on every train or in every street corner, they do have the resources to respond when people are abusive or create disturbance or are intimidating or threatening towards members of the public. And I would hope that shop workers would have the confidence to phone the police in those circumstances and that they would, I am sure, get a speedy response. And I call Claire Bailey. Next question. Thank you. Minister, can you let us know what the membership of the Antisocial Behaviour Delivery Group, led by your department, um, consists of, please? Um, Mr Speaker, it's a cross-departmental um, multi-agency group which brings together officials from local government, um, from the Department for Communities, um, from my own department um, and I think also from the Executive Office. But I will write to the member in more detail to give her the full details of its membership and complement. However, the work of that group is hugely important um, in terms of tackling antisocial behaviour um, because we do have clearly issues around how we tackle that. Those issues have been multiplied by COVID but they do pre-exist it, and it's something that we have been working on in terms of an antisocial behaviour strategy um, and how we might implement better procedures going forward. Claire Bailey, supplementary. Thank you. Can the Minister let us know how often or how many times the group has met to date and if the strategy will be published so we can see it in some form of a report? Well, in terms of an update on the review, obviously there will be um, an opportunity for people to see uh, an outcome 
We are currently engaging with stakeholders in the review of ASB legislation, including with colleagues across other departments, to gather evidence and discuss what changes, if any, should be made to the legislation. Non-legislative measures, however, are also currently being considered and any structures to allow for partnership and collaborative working. It is a PFG commitment to review ASB legislation, and we do have a momentum for that, heavily influenced, I have to say, by disorder in the Holy Lands linked to on-street drinking. We undertook in April 2018, the DOJ undertook a public consultation on this. The response was published in December 2019. And since the publication of that response um, document, we are now taking this forward in terms of how we're going to um, gather evidence and share that. First meeting of the delivery group um, to progress the work was held in July, a second meeting in August, and there are plans in place for monthly meetings. Any legislative change spanning across a number of departments is unlikely to be commenced within this mandate. However, as I've said, there is an opportunity for us to take this work through um, in terms of non-legislative measures, and an update on the work is, will be with the Justice Committee in the new year. I call Pat Sheehan. Uh, Last week, Minister, your uh, department published a summary of the consultation responses to the sentencing policy review. Uh, I'm just wondering, could the Minister outline her next steps and how soon she thinks this can be turned into an action plan? Well, first of all, I want to thank and put on record my appreciation of everyone who responded to that consultation. Um, we often hear debate about sentencing, sentencing structures and, and so on. It's hugely important that when people get the opportunity to give us their feedback, they do that. I think what was stark for me, certainly in reviewing the consultation document, were the number of responses, particularly um, around road traffic deaths. Um, and I think that that was largely as a result of the incredible campaign um, by Enda Dolan's parents um, in order to focus attention on that element um, of this of the consultation. But throughout um, that consultation, we have had some very, I think, thought-provoking responses, and I think there will be an opportunity for us to take that forward. I'm currently considering those responses. We will then move on to see whether there are changes which need to be made in terms of the sentencing framework, or whether there are other issues that are non-legislative that can be taken forward in the interim to ensure that people feel that the, the time and energy which they invested in the consultation is repaid in terms of outturn. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, I'm just wondering, given that there were a number of issues not included in the consultation in regard to sentencing, such as drugs and car theft, does the Minister believe that the issues dealt with uh, regarding sentencing in the consultation go far enough to address the lack of pub public confidence uh, in sentencing policy? Well, I would say a couple of things in response to that. First of all, what the sentencing review didn't do was indicate that there was a lack of confidence in sentencing policy. Um, there is sometimes a lack of understanding of sentencing policy, and I think that that needs to be addressed as much by members of this House when they communicate sentencing to understand um, the detail of the sentences and how they're arrived at. And I have had, I've been on a steep learning curve myself with respect to sentencing um, over the last eight months. I think it is hugely important um, when we come to the sentencing review that we look not only to those issues which were covered um, in the sentencing review, but also to other issues which may be raised as we take this forward um, when it comes to, for example, legislation. Others may want to feed in, including members of this, this House, and they will have ample opportunity to do so through the Justice Committee or indeed to me directly. Call Morris Bradley. Bigger. Can I ask a minister, would she agree that the PSNI's current 101 reporting system uh, needs an, um, uh, an urgent overhaul? The operation of the 101 system um, is a matter which is operational and one for um, the Chief Constable and the Policing Board to take forward. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the reason I ask is because I get regular complaints from constituents who feel like criminals when they try to report an incident, especially an incident that has a sensitive nature. And also they feel that some of the operators that answer the calls, uh, they hang up because geographically they don't know where the complainant is speaking about. So it is, it is a, a, I think, an urgent matter that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Um, Mr Speaker, I would be more than happy if the member wants to write to me to pass that um, concern to the Chief Constable for him to look at in due course. 
I could take uh, Catherine Kelly for a very short period of time. Minister, the Justice Committee is due to conclude the committee stage of the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill in the next fortnight. Can you indicate a timeline for completing the passage of this legislation? Well, first of all, I want to say again my thanks to the Justice Committee. Um, this was a weighty piece of legislation, um, and there have, I think, been some significant improvements to it through the committee system, which is why I believe that scrutiny is so important. Um, in terms of taking this forward, I will be meeting with the Chair and Deputy Chair um, shortly, not just to look at, this, at the scheduling of this particular piece of legislation in terms of its consideration and further consideration stage, but also um, in terms of other legislation which we hope to introduce um, into the Assembly um, over the autumn. It is also, of course, a matter for this House through the Speaker to schedule the business. So perhaps um, having heard your plea um, for us to do this quickly, Mr Speaker, will be minded um, to accommodate. And unfortunately, time is up, so we can't explore that matter any further at the moment. Okay, members could... Go ahead, Mr Nesbitt, point of order. Uh, the Justice Minister, when I asked her about conversations with the Secretary of State, said... I didn't know what conversations she had had because I hadn't asked that question. Hansard for the 22nd.